Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makpool, with you at BTB World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at two important stories. The first is with reference to what has happened recently in India, the blasphemous remarks that have been put forward by Nupur Sharma and in the aftermath of which we've, of course, seen a lot of controversy, a lot of backlash, especially from Muslim nations around the world, since, of course, the Muslim sentiment has been heard uh, because of these remarks. Um, what we now see is that the court has also uh, called upon uh, Nupur Sharma being responsible to set the country on fire. They have made several observations, uh, including the fact that her loose tongue has set the country on fire uh, and many others that point towards the fact uh, that this is something that is not uh, uh, appropriate for a political party spokesperson uh, and that uh, the uh, words used, the way things are being said by a spokesperson of the party, the ruling party in fact, uh, needs to be perhaps more responsible and less hurtful and it is because of these statements and others such as these uh, that violence incidents have occurred, especially the incident in Udaipur as well. So um, it is uh, perhaps encouraging to see uh, that this is being recognized but what really is happening and how exactly can we actually actually see justice prevailing in India with regards to the treatment uh, that is being met out to the Muslim population and then of course the way the courts respond and then the kind of words and hate speeches that will have become a regular habit uh, of the BJP leaders and others within India and what needs to be done in that regard. So we'll talk about that in further detail in our first segment of the show. In our second segment, we'll be taking a look at the situation in Afghanistan and the recent talks that are scheduled to be held between the US and the Taliban in Doha. Uh, and we're going to be uh, trying to figure out what exactly is going to be the outcome of these talks. Of course, financial issues are also on the front and they're going to be under discussion uh, to develop new ways to actually help out the people of Afghanistan ease their suffering and avert the humanitarian crisis that exists over there. Again, something that uh, have, has been talked about before and has been stalled for a while now, uh, but we know that the U.S. had earlier made an executive decision to at least keep half of the frozen assets for the people of Afghanistan. Is that going to really happen and what is the mechanism that is going to be evolved for that to happen? We're going to be taking a look in further detail. Since, of course, the situation in Afghanistan has worsened after the earthquake hit the country recently. So that is going to be our second segment of the show today. For this and more, as usual, in the studios, we have with us Farooq Patafi and Raja Faisal. And for our first segment, we have with us online Dr. John Dial from India. He's an Indian human rights activist. And we've also been joined by Dr. Kamar Chima, who's a foreign affairs expert. And uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us and being a part of the show. I apologize that we don't have with us Dr. Kamar Chima. Um, and we have with us Dr. John Dial at the moment. And we will, be, uh, we will also be going to him and our other guest to talk more about the details, of course, of what is going on within India. I'll start with you, Dr. John. When we look at the situation, this is, of course, quite worrisome, uh, what is happening uh, within India and the fact that we have seen such hate speeches uh, from the BJP and other leaders uh, is, is, of course, a matter of great concern, something that is very sensitive to the Muslim population, both within and outside of India as well. Particularly, Nupur Sharma's remarks are, of course, quite problematic. Um, this is something uh, that really needs to be dealt with properly. And we were thinking that perhaps the courts in India are not going to be holding her accountable. Um, even the BJP's move of suspension was viewed just in the aftermath of the Arab leaders or the Arab nations talking about boycotting of Indian products. Um, so I want to understand the court's response uh, in this regard and exactly how do you see the remarks that have been put forward where Nupur Sharma has been called out on her actions. And uh, before I do that, uh, let me also uh, welcome uh, in the show Dr. Mohammed Ali Hashmi and Alhamdi, senior journalist online with us. Thank you very much for joining us in the debate. I'll start with you, Dr. John Dial, if you could answer that question, please. Yeah, thank you very much for having me once again. Actually, the situation is far more serious than it will be possible for anybody outside India to imagine because we live here, we see nuances which are not covered by the official media or even the private media and the international media. We see not only that Nupur Sharma enjoys, in a way, extreme popular support at the behest of the RSS and the ruling party. There have been rallies held for her in various towns where the party seems to have uh, a seat of power or whatever, in Rajasthan and elsewhere in the country. And that is what worries me far more 
than what is happening in the courts. Because the courts, the Supreme Court, today went to unusual lengths to castigate her for almost putting the country on edge. But they haven't asked the police to arrest her forthwith. Although they have been not so kind to Tista and to several others, among them journalists. And that is worrisome. But uh, let, let me come back to the ground situation. On the ground, what would happen if Nupur were to be arrested? Is as powerful a question as asking what would happen if you were not to be arrested. And that's a catch-22 which faces both the government and the courts. Because in the days following her uh, extremely vulgar and criminal behavior on TV, which itself was part of what she has been saying for the last five, seven years, and what yes. even more senior BJP spokespersons have been saying, including Mr. Samit Patra, who is the chief TV person on them. So uh, the response after that, a yes. uh, has been killed in Rajasthan, that's on the one side. But as I was saying, communities are ranged. That right. is. Uh, Dr. Jandyal, uh, let me also uh, talk about the observation uh, of the Honorable Court. I was following that and there was this uh, observation regarding the way media had, uh, handles sub cases uh, in India. And there was uh, observation that this somehow actually is a setup. Do you think that that is the case and there is a solution to that as well? No, I, I would not like to say there's a setup. But what I have said, I've gone a step further than you are saying. It is not a set-piece drama in which the court is one of the actors, the government is the third, and all of us are the fourth, fifth, and sixth. What I'm saying is, for the government, as well as for the courts, it's a catch-22. I just said, and this was check up with your ground reporters, there is a movement, a pop, absolute coordinated political effort to get people roused in support of Nupur. If anything happens to her, if she's put in jail, if government is seen to crack down on her, if government is seen as supporting the Muslim outrage, the Indian outrage, the international outrage. Very true. If, if that, so what happens to the ground is the situation. Very true, sir. Very true. And uh, Dr. Muhammad Al-Hashmi, I'll come towards you. If we, uh, you know, look at this particular incident, obviously after that, what we saw in the uh, Middle East and the Muslim world throughout, that there was obviously, a, you know, backlash for India. And I think this is how India, India was forced to, uh, you know, uh, take up this case in this way. But at the same time, you being a journalist, I wanted to ask a question from you. Uh, obviously, if we look at the treatment of uh, journalists overall and Muslim journalists uh, within India, uh, it is very odd right now. Muhammad Zubair, uh, he was obviously arrested. Then if we look at uh, Rana Ayub, earlier she was uh, obviously, you know, uh, threatened with the rape, threatened, threatened with the life, and now she's been uh, withheld her content was being withheld within India. What would you uh, say about this, sir? I think it's a very sad state. I think uh, what what is happening today is a culmination of uh, a political strategy adopted by Mr. Modi and the BGP party mm. by injuring Muslim, by persecuting like a quarter of a billion Indian Muslims, they are seeking the votes of Hindu extremists. They are uh, playing a very dirty sort of politics. And now they don't want journalists to report what they are doing. And they are persecuting Muslim journalists, especially inside India, and like the case of uh, Rana Ayub outside India. But I want to tell you, and probably Mr. Moody and his associates, if they are listening, that the world now is aware of the new fascist mood in India, of the persecution of Muslims in India. Now with um, uh, people uh, writing in Twitter and Facebook and in Instagram, we can see a new India that we do not recognize. 
Mm. It's very, very sad that India is now presenting itself to the world as the capital of Islamophobia. I don't know what Mr. Modi will win by dividing India in this way. I think Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, civil society in the Arab countries, in Muslim countries, in Europe, will all, all of them will raise their voices against what is happening in India. I think Mus uh, Indian Muslims should know that they are not alone, that there are many people, Muslims and non-Muslims, who are not happy what, what is happening to them, and they are showing solidarity with them. It will take some time, because Mr. Modi doesn't show uh, any sign. Uh, Dr. Hashmi, if I could just ask you with regards to the responses that we've seen uh, from the Arab world and the Muslim world, uh, this is something that has happened uh, because of Nupur Sharma's remarks. Um, and I can understand why that is close to uh, the hearts of Muslims around the world as well. But there is so much that happens that is a huge violation of the fundamental freedoms of Muslims in India, their basic religious uh, rights, uh, their, their sanctities, their lives. And minorities. Uh, yes, uh, and other minorities as well. Uh, but we don't see a similar response coming in from the Arab world or Muslim world or the world in general as well. But we've seen this response and sort of seen a consequence of that response that we uh, did see action from the BJP. We did see some action from the courts. Perhaps if we can get a similar kind of response from the Arab world for other kinds of injustices as well, uh, then maybe we, we can see a change. First of all, I'd like to commend the... Uh, Pakistani reaction. We really, I, I praise the people of Pakistan for their, for, for them showing their solidarity with Indian Muslims, they are their brothers. Pakistan is leading the way in many cases like this. It's your country that led the efforts to get the International Day against Islamophobia. As a Muslim, as an Arab, I'm proud of Pakistan. I'm proud of you. That's one thing. The second, we are not doing enough as Arabs. Because unfortunately, without going to, into details, our governments are not, in many places, not the best of governments we uh, hope uh, to be in place. But the Arab public opinion, Arabs, ordinary citizens, are taking it to Twitter, to Facebook, to Instagram, to denounce what is happening to Muslims. In Kuwait, people have stopped buying Indian goods. In Qatar, there was official and non-official reactions to what is happening, and it is growing, unless unless the BGP changes its course, or hopefully the Indian electorate will bring back the Congress party to power. I think this movement in the Arab world will grow. In the last two years, we have seen a boycott of French goods because of those uh, cartoons depicting Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi I think this will be repeated with India. There will be calls for uh, Arab government to stop employing probably uh, like uh, Hindu right. people, not because we don't like them. They are our brothers in humanity. We've, been, we've, we've lived with them for, for centuries. We, have, we are brothers. But what the government of Modi is doing is really, really, really very dangerous. And it is a threat to India, uh, interest to peace in the region, and it, it must stop. So I can tell you that there is a growing movement now of discontent in the Arab world, and it will manifest itself uh, like in a, a louder way, hopefully in the next few weeks. But let's pray and hope that the BGP will listen Take them to reason. Yeah. Of course, uh, uh, Sana, I think Dr. Dial actually wants to make an intervention. Let's go there. Yeah. Dr. Dial, you wanted to say something, sir. Yeah, uh, very briefly. What I wanted to say was that the Indian Muslim is not alone. The rest of us, Christians, yes. and a very, very vast number of Hindus. Please do not go by the fact that Mr. Modi is ruling and his party has won, but large numbers of people, including those who would be inclined towards his ideology, are opposed to the extreme path that has been taken by the RSS and by him and by people like Nupur and others. So they, we have been, including me, at my age and physical situation, we've been out on the road protesting, demonstrating. You must have seen the photographs and the documentary coverage of that. So mm. the Indian Muslim is not alone. Most of India is with her and him and the little children. So uh, they are our brothers and sisters. I think we will be feeding into Mr. Modi's ego if we presume 
that the extremists have the upper hand. Right. Yes. Uh, Dr. Dal, uh, let me also ask uh, you about uh, what is going on in India. Uh, uh, when you talk about BJP and its uh, erratic behavior, that seems to be an outcome of uh, something else, something de uh, deeper. What exactly is that? Is there a malaise in Indian society that is manifesting itself uh, through BJP? There's a malaise in the world. Hmm. There's a malaise of people who suffer from the consequences of the acts of their ancestors. There was a partition in India. Lots of Hindus were killed. Lots of Muslims were killed. Perhaps in equal number, perhaps in an unequal number. That has been a bleeding sore in Indian politics over and over again. The last 70 years, it has never, we've never had, in both countries, and all three now, with Bangladesh, we've never had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We've never come to terms with the fact that the past, let the past, dead past bury its dead. We've never come to that situation. So it's easy for political parties, every time there's an economic doldrum, every time there's some other issue, to rouse people on the passion. Otherwise, the BJP would never have been able to go beyond one or two seats in some extreme situations. Religion, to play religion successfully in elections, requires some roots. And I'm afraid the BJP, its roots are going to into that sore to feed. Nathuram Godse killed Gandhi. People seem to have forgotten that. The RSS's record of bloodshed, people seem to have forgotten that. Islamophobia comes from what is happening in other countries, et cetera, et cetera, and it feeds here. We have not been able to nip it in the bud, and we are paying the price for it. Right. Dr. Hashmi, um, earlier you were talking about uh, the kinds of uh, unofficial and official responses that we have. Before I move further, I oh, just want to clarify one thing, that if this is uh, the case of Nupur Sharma, um, is it the verdict that comes out of this is satisfying enough that there has been a consequence to her actions? Do you think that the, the boycott, uh, the unofficial or official boycotts will actually stop? Uh, because that's not the end. There's so much else that's wrong, as we were earlier talking about. I just want to know whether it's just this particular case uh, uh, to which this response is limited. I'm, I welcome the Supreme Court uh, rhetoric today. It's, it's very encouraging. It shows that India is not, is not uh, uh, only broadcasting on the moody way. We like that India. We need that India. You know, in, in history, uh, Egypt and India, they played the leading role in founding the non-alignment movement. Mm. Although there was a division there in Southeast Asia, or the creation of Pakistan, but we always looked at Pakistan as our brothers and India as our friends. So we hope and we pray that we can get back to that normal relations. But I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, that Moody's strategy, the BJP party strategy, is to work on um, this this line of politics, this line of dirty politics, of racial politics, of uh, raising the tensions between Muslim and Hindus. I can see it here in London where I live. I have a lot of friends, Hindu friends. We've been like brothers for ages. And then suddenly I can see the change in their mood, in their attitude yeah. towards me, towards my family. I think it's the, the Moody effect. So that's a, a big problem. I hope, I see, I follow Raul Gandhi in, uh, on Twitter. I see he is showing solidarity with Muslims. I hope voices like him and like what we heard today from the Supreme Court in India will prevail. But I think that's right. a task for, yes. for India. Uh, Dr. Dial, Dr. Dial, I wanted to come towards you. I wanted to tell you about what happened in Pakistan. Of course, Pakistan. Uh, is a country that has seen war and uh, terror. We have been fighting against uh, the extremism for uh, 15 consecutive years, and that extremism was, uh, uh, you know, obviously it originated uh, back in the 80s, and uh, that extremism later on it became a problem for Pakistan itself, and Pakistan had to fight it out uh, at that time. So I wanted to uh, uh, ask you: Is this uh, uh, the same factor with today's India, that today's India is, uh, you know, infil infiltrating extremism within uh, their societies, especially Hindu extremism, and that extremism is leading India towards a disaster, 
and uh, there might be a time that if India wants to save itself, then of course they have to fight with the very people they are investing in uh, today. And let me add to this, uh, uh, just my personal observation, it can be wrong, you can disagree, that at the time of creation of <coughs> India and Pakistan, there was an extremism uh, problem in India that was Hindu extremism problem. There was a Muslim uh, extremism problem in Pakistan. Pakistan finally woke up in 2002, mm. and then we started fighting it. But India could not, and that's mm. why the, the organization that was repeatedly banned, RSS, took over the state, and now India, India is lost to it. Is, it. is it true that it is too late already? I'm afraid India too has been a victim of terrorism for various reasons and in various parts of the country, including in the north. Uh, I am not going into that. I am talking about the tension that we face and we've been trying to fight all these 75 years. At various, during Mrs. Gandhi's time, during Rajiv Gandhi's time, it wasn't very much. It was not, not existent. Hindu-Muslim clashes took place by the dozen every year. People were killed by the dozen, bilaterally essentially. But after Babri Masjid, there has been an extreme build-up of this mm. tension. During, even during Mr. Atal Bari Vajpayee's time, it was there. And, and Mr. Modi's Gujarat 2002 saw a burst of it. Today, again, for instance, this whole business of changing names, Muslim place names into Hindu place names, and so on and yeah. so forth, shows that there are elements who would like to maximize political benefits de banking on religious divides. But as I was telling you, in a country of a billion and a quarter, the fact that we still have some sort of reasonable elections, we have been choosing governments across, not all of them are BJP governments. BJP has been defeated, it has won, it has been defeated nationally just now, it is ruling. And I'm sure people like me would like to hope and pray and work to ensure that it's defeated peacefully in the next general election, which is the only way we know how to do regime change. But mm -hmm. the point really is that we need to work together in India without right. too much. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jondial, I'll just take the last question from Dr. Hashmi since we're almost out of time. Dr. Hashmi, when we look at the situation that is going on in India and then, of course, other parts of the world, you mentioned uh, Pakistan's efforts towards Islamophobia as well. Uh, but, of course, what Dr. Jondial earlier was saying as well points towards the kind of togetherness or consensus that is needed for a collective action to take place. We still haven't really seen that coming in from the Muslim countries as well as to how we're going to be able to respond to uh, such incidents in the future as well and elsewhere uh, in the world. Um, how do you think we can actually achieve that goal? Because right now what has happened seems to be just an immediate reaction, mm. uh, but we don't have a collective framework, framework to deal with this issue. Yeah, we are, we are not doing enough, especially in the Arab world. We, we should, supposedly we should be the, leading the way. So I think you are, let's, let me say it like, you are, it's a, a task, a noble task. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen you the Pakistani nation, maybe to lead these efforts, that's great. I hope you can coordinate with Malaysia, with uh, Turkey, with other countries like this to uh, make your, the voice of Muslims heard in a better way. I can assure you that now Muslims around the globe uh, are like a force to reckon with. Their voices are heard on social media. It's uh, efficient, it's effective. And I hope uh, and pray that also all reasonably minded people in India, Muslims and non-Muslims, will get their act together to beat the BGP in the next election. We need India. I tell any Indian listener now listening to us, any Hindu, that you are, you're, you, are, you are our brother in humanity. You are, if she's a lady, you are our sister in humanity. We'd like to be friends with you. All right. Thank we you very much, Dr. Hashmi and Dr. Dr. John Dial for joining us. Religion. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Uh, Farooq, with respect to what has happened in the courts today, does that in any way at all uh, give us any hope, or do you think it's in any way encouraging to see the reaction that has come out? You know, uh, uh, Sana, the most interesting thing about my commentary on India is hmm. that uh, most of the people think that I'm going, uh, I'm going to say something which is going to uh, you know, hurt sentiments. Hmm. But honestly, what I keep on dreaming about, and let us talk about the Indian experience, 
Indian history, uh, India is a, a country tormented by history because they have a very checkered history of colonization and repeatedly, uh, repeated exploitation. Now they are rising. And at that time, it is very important to learn the right kind of lessons. Unfortunately, what is happening is they keep on learning the wrong kind of, uh, you know, uh, lessons from their tormentors. And that's why we are seeing everything that is happening. Right now, I see hope in what the court did today. Okay. But it was delayed. Hmm. My only problem is the way this mistake was made. This provocation, this meaningless, useless, stupid mistake. Uh, or provocation for that matter. It is so damaging to India because mm. there is no solution. What are you going to do? Yeah. Are you going to hang uh, N Nupur Sharma yeah. uh, in a volatile country like India? Mm. What exactly will you do? You have no solution. That means there will be a permanent, you know, uh, wedge between Muslims and non-Muslims in India. Thanks. That is not affordable. So that's why I was highlighting the comment about media as well. It is important to silence those channels whose job it has become to Absolutely. actually True. keep on pushing Hindutva agenda. It Absolutely. is horrible. Agreed. Absolutely. And, and, and we hope that India itself realizes the kind of impact it's having on its people and the country. We're now going to be taking uh, our uh, segment to the second segment, which is the, the talks between the U.S. and the Taliban in Doha. Uh, something, of course, uh, that we all have eyes on in terms of uh, relieving the people in Afghanistan from their suffering and particularly the economic challenges the country has been faced with since the U.S. troops withdrawal. For this, uh, we have been joined online by Mr. Jangir Khatter, who's the senior analyst. Thank you very much for joining us online, Mr. Jangir. Um, we, of course, <laughs> are expecting these talks to happen soon. Um, and uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion on the economic situation as well, particularly the humanitarian aid uh, that needs to be urgently delivered to Afghanistan. However, we have seen these discussions in the past as well uh, and perhaps still haven't really worked out a mechanism of exactly how it's going to be done. Do you think that this time around that can actually be worked out? Thank you so much, uh, Sana, for having me and hello to your guests as well. Uh, the talks have happened. Uh, Amir Khan Muttaki, who is the acting foreign yes, minister sir. of uh, Afghanistan, yeah. uh, he met Thomas West and he was joined, like Thomas West was joined by USAID officials, Department of Treasury officials and other senior administration officials were there in Doha right. uh, today. And uh, the Afghan team was led by, of course, uh, Amir Khan Muttaki and he was uh, his delegation included uh, officials from the Afghanistan Bank, which is the central bank of Afghanistan, their uh, finance ministry and other officials of the Taliban government. Uh, the conversation uh, had a multi-pronged agenda. One was, uh, of course, the release of the frozen funds. The U.S. froze about $9.5 billion, $7 billion being here in the U.S., uh, after Taliban took over. And then in February, pre President Biden announced that 3.5 billion of that uh, frozen amount or money will go to the survivors of the 9-11 victims because they had gone to the court of law. And the case is still in the court. The court, in fact, gave a judgment. Yeah, it is set that, aside. Right, exactly. So yeah. the court yeah. the court has given a judgment. And because of that, the, the uh, Biden administration said that because of the court injunction, we have to set aside half of the money. Now, half of the money, release of $3.5 billion, that conversation has been happening. But the conversation that happened in Doha uh, today uh, was about uh, not just the release of funds, the Afghan economy, which has virtually collapsed, the dire humanitarian crisis that uh, Afghanistan is facing, 24 million people facing virtual starvation. They are short on uh, food, money, everything. And then uh, more than a million people, children are not getting enough food every day. Uh, inflation has reached 42% in Afghanistan. So the situation is really bad. The conversation really had, uh, you know, they, they did talk about the Afghan economy. And then uh, uh, there was no substantive progress, to say the least, because the Thomas, uh, the Thomas West led team, like Thomas West, informed the Afghan delegation that we are in conversation with the Treasury Department, with U.S. Congress to remove all the legal and other impediments uh, so that we can uh, 
work out a mechanism uh, wherein this money can be dispersed. The U.S. is in no mood to give the money directly to Taliban. The conversation that's happening, the debate that's going on in Washington, D.C. right now is to distribute that money, uh, first of all, in installments, second, through third party. It could be like a trust fund led by World Bank, or it could be a trust fund by any other organization, including some like uh, organization of Islamic Conference or Islamic Development Bank, we don't know yet. But different mechanisms are under consideration. And uh, uh, the U.S. again, of course, was asking Taliban uh, about their promises. And Amir Khan Muttaki, the Taliban government has uh, released uh, a statement as well on the on the internet, or especially on social media, that uh, the Taliban delegation assured them that they do they, 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 they will uphold the commitments that they made with the, uh, with the West, especially the U.S. Uh, and under Doha agreement, they did not give direct reference to Doha agreement, but it, there was a very strong hint for that. All uh, right. and, and then, of course, about the drug trafficking, because we have seen reports coming out of Afghanistan that uh, the, the poppy cultivation right, absolutely. has increased. And we'll continue that discussion as well, Mr. Jangi. Let me just welcome in the debate Michael Kugelman, who's a political analyst. He's joined us on Telephone Line. And Mr. Ayaz Vazid, who's a former ambassador, also joining us on Telephone Line. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. I'll start with you, Michael. Uh, Mr. Jangi is giving us a comprehensive overview of the discussion that has been held so far. Um, and uh, what he has said uh, has mainly focused on, of course, trying to figure out how to uh, get the funds not directly to the Taliban, but then to trickle it down uh, to the people through a third party um, or a any other mechanism. Uh, and then, of course, also the Taliban's earlier commitments, which we still really haven't seen much progress on yet. But again, these discussions are quite repetitive in, in, in what we have seen in the past as well. This is the same discussion that has been going around for a while now of developing an, a way to get the aid directly to the people. And it seems like it's just happening again, but there's really no progress. What do you make of it? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, indeed, I mean, we've seen this movie before. Uh, there have been a number of discussions, and it hasn't appeared to lead to major breakthroughs in terms of... Um, the U.S. coming to uh, being able to come to some sort of new arrangement to provide more assistance to Afghanistan. But I think this meeting is significant um, for several reasons. One is that it's, it's come soon after the earthquake in Afghanistan. And I think that U.S. officials have really woken up to the reality that um, Afghanistan needs so much more help than it's been getting from the U.S. and others. Uh, second, um, I believe this may be the first meeting that Tom West has had with senior Taliban officials since the decision on the part of the Taliban uh, not to let older girls go back to school. And that was something that was uh, was not received well at all in D.C. So, again, that suggests that despite that concern about these policies toward women uh, in Afghanistan, that the, the U.S. officials are still willing to engage with the Taliban to try to figure out a way uh, to get more money um, to the country. It will be very difficult, as I think was alluded to before. A lot of legal obstacles here in Washington. Um, to get around this problem of uh, sanctions and other things. I do think, though, uh, we have to remember that several months ago, uh, the Biden administration um, came out with an executive order that essentially carved out several million dollars of these frozen bank assets to protect them from pending um, litigation being pursued by some 9-11 um, uh, families who wanted to, to sue to get access to some of that funding. The Biden administration had essentially come out with an executive order to try, try, try to prevent, protect that money from any litigation. And I think that's what we're dealing with now, is that the administration is trying to figure out a mechanism where it could use some of these monies um, to, in, in a way that can be helpful, not necessarily for humanitarian assistance, because Afghans believe that you know, this money is their money. It should be put back in the Afghan Central Bank. So I think that's what the focus may be on. But indeed, I'm not all that optimistic. There's so much political pressure here in Washington about doing anything that could be seen as helping the Taliban and certainly putting money in its hands. But bottom line, you know, final point is clearly this earthquake, uh, this terrible earthquake, has made it very clear to folks in the exactly. U.S. that more has to be done to help Afghans, not to help the Taliban, but help Afghans. That's the biggest priority. Helping Afghans, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, Ambassador Ayaz, I'll come towards you. Uh, obviously, when we talk about uh, uh, the Doha agreement, that agreement uh, did ask 
uh, for uh, there were expectations from uh, the Taliban uh, the world was having and obviously uh, them expectations were not met so far and of course the work is still uh, you know being done on that uh, I just wanted to ask will there be a mechanism after this meetup uh, will there be a mechanism that is derived to uh, check whatever the improvements are being made uh, by the Taliban uh, regime uh, especially when it comes to uh, you know uh, not letting their land uh, used for uh, terrorism against the neighboring countries or any of the other country of the world and of course uh, the human rights especially the women rights and if we talk about the inclusiveness uh, of the government would it be done this time sir Uh, Ambassador from, Ayaz? Uh, from, uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes we can, can, sir. We can, sir. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for having me, but we have to look at the problem in Afghanistan from the Afghani angle also, not only one way to affect from the American angle. I understand Americans have their concern, and they should have, but look at the agreement what was agreed upon. And uh, there is, a, I believe, a certain section of that agreement which was not made public. So I better not comment more on this because maybe the real thing is in that secret clause of it. But the general agreement was that the Taliban would not allow the Afghan soil to be used against America or any other country. Uh, uh, that is true. And they also promised that uh, they will have, a, they will uh, take care of the women rights, uh, human rights, and uh, their government would be all inclusive. But if you look at the difficulties that they faced, the Taliban, when they took over, right from day one, we do not see any country coming forward to help them. Uh, rather, they were faced with the dilemma of uh, recognition, which still is not coming, though they are uh, in the 11th month of uh, their government. Tell me where on earth every government has fulfilled 100% what we are expecting of the Taliban. But that doesn't mean the Taliban can be a job of the uh, uh, promise or responsibility that they have taken upon themselves. But what I suggest is that uh, instead of debating as to who was at fault and who was not, let's look at the real problem of Afghanistan, a very poor country, 40 years of uh, this uh, uh, war going on, now peace has somehow returned, whether we like the Taliban or not. Afghanistan, that way, is a bit peaceful, but nature was not kind to them, struck by a very devastating earthquake. And uh, there they need money and uh, food assistance, human, uh, 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 I mean, anything required for human beings, shelter and everything, medicine, uh, uh, you name a thing, they need it. And, uh, but the unfortunate part is that the U.S. has, uh, though now, decided to come out with some help to the Afghan, but they have, at the same time they have uh, 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 frozen the Afghan $9.5 uh, billion, I think, dollar in, in the American yeah. bank, which is the Afghan money. And I don't think the American government has legally or morally any ground to spend that money even on Afghan because that is an Afghan money and the Afghan government should uh, uh, spend that money on the welfare of their own people. Right, so absolutely. Um, let me go look. to uh, Mr. Jangir again. Um, earlier we yeah. talked about the mechanism that you were saying that is needed to be developed uh, for the people of uh, Afghanistan. And this is what Michael was also talking to, that the emphasis is on helping Afghans and not the Taliban. But I want to understand how that is even possible, uh, considering the current situation, considering that uh, there is uh, uh, no sight of any recognition of the current Taliban regime. How exactly is that mechanism going to be developed? I understand you talked about the third parties uh, but how soon can we really see that happening and, and there must be so many uh, nuances within this uh, this uh, proposition as well um, that we and we are seeing the crisis right now that uh, we don't really see it happening and Khatak uh, since you uh, spoke about the trust fund to be established as well I was wondering what is wrong with the creating or giving uh, the Afghanistan bank that kind of status 
so that it is autonomous, but it can also take care of the monetary issue. True. These are very critical questions. The world has difficult choices here if you are looking from the Western point of view. And if you are looking from Afghan point of view, just like uh, Ambassador Wazir mentioned, that uh, it is their money, and it is true as well. It is their money. And uh, the way U.S. Has, has stopped it, that is also a big problem. Uh, and the U.S. has its own legal issues. Uh, in terms of the mechanism, uh, this conversation of a trust fund has been in circulation for a while because this was a concern when the Taliban took over, because even today, if you look at the Taliban leadership, 40 of their top leaders were on the UN's uh, blacklist, like they could not travel overseas. Now, the, the Taliban committee that the UN Security Council has, which review uh, their position, I think every three months, they just held a meeting. They uh, put, they added two new people uh, to that list, and they had given exemption to basically, I think, 15 uh, Taliban officials, in, including uh, Mutaki, uh, Abir Khan Mutaki. Uh, so they gave the those out of 15, 13 got the exemption, but two were, two did not get the exemption. Who were those two people? The Afghan ha Minister for Higher Education and his deputy. Why? Because of the girls' education. The problem is that uh, many of the Taliban leaders remain on the blacklist. Uh, the U.S. and the many Western countries, remember that out of this $9.5 billion, not the entire amount is here in the U.S. About $7 billion is in the New York uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank, and uh, rest of it is in Europe and even in United Arab Emirates. Uh, but everyone is following the international law, and that is where the problem arises. How to disperse this money? The U.S. just announced $55 million. The U.N. had called for $110 million in emergency aid for the earthquake victims uh, mm -hmm. for, to support them, to sustain them for the next three months. The U.S. just announced $55 million. The deficiency mm -hmm. is still there, but at least half of the amount the U.S. has yeah. announced. Now, that money will also be disbursed not directly to Taliban. Rather, mm -hmm. it will be the U.S. will adopt the same mechanism that he, it has been doing. So far, it mm -hmm. has given more than $700 million since Taliban came in humanitarian mm -hmm. aid. And that has gone through uh, international non -pro uh, NGOs. And I think yeah. the same will happen again. Now, in the future, exactly. just like you mentioned about uh, the Afghanistan Bank, this is a consideration that exactly. some bureaucrats, some experts may be given some sort of a mandate to manage some of the funds that will be transferred to Afghanistan Bank because until and unless the Afghanistan's economy is reconnected with the international economy, yeah. Afghanistan mm -hmm. may not survive this disaster, this unfolding humanitarian exactly. disaster. Between I, 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 and I, I, <coughs> sir, I'll go, towards, I'll go towards uh, Michael. Michael, uh, uh, you know, when, whenever we talk about the 9.5 billion uh, uh, US dollars, of course, I mean, uh, there is uh, a, another perspective about it uh, as well, that the money was entirely uh, obviously gathered through uh, the funds or aid money which was supposed to go to uh, uh, Afghanistan at that time. But of course, uh, when the uh, situation on ground became suddenly different, that's when America started punishing, uh, obviously, Taliban regime. Is it true or there is uh, some other narrative you have about it that 9.5 billion uh, US dollars uh, that uh, we all talk about, uh, you know, Afghanistan have it? And also, Michael, if you could add to that, because earlier, Mr. Jangi, were saying that, of course, uh, we, we have seen in the past that more than 700 million have already been given. Mm. Um, so there has been a flow of money already taking place, which means there is a channel and there's there's more that has been announced, uh, which means there is going to be a channel for that to also uh, go to the people of Afghanistan and the earthquake victims. Why is it that the same cannot be used? Uh, mm. Is it is it a problem uh, with regards to the amount or with regards to the channel? How is it any different? Right. So, you know, when we hear about all of this um, assistance that the U.S. has provided to Afghanistan, this is all humanitarian assistance. Um, and, you know, it's, it's provided that assistance legally from a U.S. perspective by channeling it through aid agencies on the ground in Afghanistan. So theoretically, none of it uh, goes to the Taliban. None of it ends up in the Taliban's hands. 
It's the other category of assistance, you know, financial assistance more broadly, that would be going to the government, to the Taliban regime. That's where there has not been any movement. Um, and I, I imagine that these meetings uh, recently are meant to find some type of middle ground that would go beyond simply the U.S. providing more aid, you know, handouts, food supplies, that type of thing, but so would fall short of formal development aid or financial assistance to to the Afghan government because the U.S. can't do that because, of course, the, the leadership is has been sanctioned. The U.S. did not impose any new sanctions on Afghanistan after the Taliban takeover, but it, it simply was uh, uh, obeying, so to speak, the existing sanctions on the Taliban organization and within power that made it, has made it very difficult to justify any ability to provide assistance, financial assistance to to the Taliban. So you know, it's going to be it's going to be very difficult for sure. But in terms of the nine million, the nine billion, you know, this is this is money that um, Afghans can rightfully argue is theirs, uh, no matter what. And not theirs literally, but it's the Afghan central banks. And that's why there's been right. this debate as to whether it's appropriate or not for the U.S. to try to use some of that money as humanitarian assistance. And there is an outcry uh, for many, including the Afghan diaspora in the United States and elsewhere, when there were there were sort of insinuations that the Biden administration would try to take some of that money out of the central bank reserves and use it for humanitarian aid. Right, absolutely. Um, so now um, I'll, I'll go to, to Ambassador to Vazir since we're short on time, Michael. So I'll just quickly go to Ambassador Vazir and ask him the last question. Uh, when we talk about um, uh, what Pakistan's role has been in the past as well, of course, we've talked about the situation in Afghanistan and have been advocating uh, this, this issue and the kind of uh, suffering that exists there and the help that is needed. And just recently also the Minister of Foreign Affairs has spoken about the easing of Western sanctions. We also see the U.S. calling on its international partners uh, and encouraging their support in this regard. Um, what exactly is it that other Western nations can do? And specifically with regards to these talks, what is our best possible? outcome here of course at the end of the day what we really need to help the situation right now is money most urgently but is there anything else that can be a good positive sign that will pave the way for uh, future betterment ambassador Vazir are you asking me yes yes uh, well I couldn't follow exactly your question but I think uh, 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 what I got was as if what else can be done uh, to help the Afghan government uh, in addition to, say, financial assistance to them. Am I right? Uh, well, my, my basic question is with regards to these talks and the role that international partners can play besides the U.S. as well. Uh, well, uh, the talks obviously uh, were between the two of them. They know it much better than us, but what we uh, understood from a date and what promises were made some of them have been fulfilled, but uh, the rest are uh, yet to be uh, uh, fulfilled also. Uh, but the Taliban, I mean, are uh, proving with every day passing that they have the capacity, they have the capability of maintaining law and order in the country. Now it is, I think, the 11th month they have entered into ruling the country, and there is no strong local resistance or resistance from outside. Now, I think what the uh, world should do is to respond to this, to extend a helping hand by recognizing that government, because the Taliban have proven to the world body that they are capable of running it. Now, the question of human rights and women rights, that can be debated. There are so many countries in the world which are also violating uh, these rules, but we have not taken it so serious against them. We are garnering the Taliban. I'm not uh, their advocate. They can do it themselves. Right. All right. Taliban Thank you very much. Thank defense. you very much, Ambassador Vazir, Michael Kugelman, and Mr. Jangi Khadak for joining us and being a part of the debate. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. We really hope that the situation eases out soon in Afghanistan and elsewhere around the world as well, and that these talks uh, do result in any sort of positive impact and real change for the people in Afghanistan. That's all we have from the debate. Have a nice weekend. See you Monday.